literally, I come from Piedmont, Sardinia, you know? And this was not a very good way of dealing with the wounded, was it? So what they do is they come up with the international symbol, reverse of the Swiss flag, and then once you're wearing that, you are then basically protected under an international law. And for people that don't know, by the way, during the Great War, German stretcher bearers and German doctors carry weapons. Was that legal? Yes. Under international law, you can carry a weapon to protect yourself, to protect your medical supplies and to protect your patients. We collectively choose not to do that. By the way, we won't do that in Burma in the Second World War because the Japanese were non-signatories to that. But the key thing is, this is the situation. And it is slightly chaotic. Why? Because although these guys are wearing the Geneva Cross, they have no medical training. And what we therefore get in 1898 is the creation of basically the melding together of the two elements within the Royal Army Medical Corps, RAMC. The problem is that the first ever campaign that they go on to actually is the Boer War, 1899 to 1902. And this new fledgling corps is, I'm afraid, confronted by a problem. The problem is, yes, and this is um, Spion Cop, actually casualties, these guys all shot through the head very neatly by Boer marksmen. The main problem actually is they have no authority. And very, very much, we're in a situation where in the Boer War, 21,000 British soldiers die. Some Canadian, some Australian, but 21,000. Of that 21,000, 7,000 die from shot and shell. 14,000 die of disease, and 140,000 are invalided home. What is killing these soldiers? The answer is the same things that kill the modern refugees. Typhoid, dysentery, enteric. And throughout the, com the conflict, British doctors are telling senior officers in the army the men should not be drinking from the Modder River. The Modder River, Dutch for muddy, is going to give you intestinal problems, even if you've got basically particulates suspended in the water. If, however, you get dysentery, then it could very easily kill you. Now, I curiously had a granddad who was called John Mafekin Massey, born in 1900, just after the relief of Mafekin, which was besieged. He was meant to be John Cyril Massey, but guess what? His uncle, Cy uh, uncle Cyril died at Mafekin from, you guessed it, enteric fever. By the way, to put that in perspective, bear in mind that from basically ancient times through to the 20th century, the thing most likely to kill you as a soldier is not the bayonet, it's not the bullet, it's not a cannonball, it's basically dying sat on the toilet, because that's the killer. I mean, how does Henry V, hero of Agincourt, die? Basically dehydration. He got dysentery and he died. And that's the way it went. But what we get in this conflict is an opportunity to give the REMC, essentially an inoculation of modern warfare. And what comes out of it is an obsession with hygiene and sanitation. Just so you know, Rommel may well have been the desert fox. He did not give a damn about hygiene and sanitation in the Second World War. He made it a very low priority, which meant the sick rate in the, uh, basically, the Africa Corps was twice that within the Eighth Army. During the first Gulf War, the sick rate in the American army was twice that as in the British army, because they had very, very little background in hygiene and sanitation. I was a boy scout in the 1960s, 70s. We were beasted about things like grease traps, how to use the latrine properly, because we knew that if we didn't, then people would get sick unnecessarily. But some of the lessons of this war, although they were learned and certainly come out of a royal commission after the war, some of them are slightly misleading. I'll give you an example. One is the use, for example, of x-ray. 
Now, frankly, I hope that guy there did not want to have children if they're doing x-ray like this. <laughs> but the key thing is, he's showing how the army is using the most modern methods as early as 1900. Here, showing actually the, the bullet lodged against a bone and how it can be found and extracted. The problem was, this war is fought in the Velk. Basically, think desert. Problem is, it's pretty sterile. So what is employed is what's called primary suture. You get an arm injury like this, we withdraw the bullet, no major problems. What we then do, clean it up, bit of iodine, sew it up, absolutely fine. And that will then heal. It's gonna be very different in 1914. So the thing to remember is, that what we get in the Boer War is massive casualties caused by disease. That will never happen again. Despite certain school textbooks that seem obsessed by the rate of sickness on the Western Front, the number of people dying from sickness is very low. The number of people ill is equally very low. But when we come to thinking about the outbreak of the Great War, we are in a situation here where actually these territorials, basically reserve forces guys, showing the kind of injuries they're expecting. Uh, here, uh, a broken leg, a broken arm, another broken arm, and as you can see, a very, very serious head wound. Um, by the way, what we also get here, just out of interest, is an orderly of the REMC. These guys here are part of a regimental aid post, an RAP, operated by your RMO, your regimental medical officer. It's misleading because it really means battalion medical officer. Uh, just out of interest, that's the box used for dressings and instruments known at the time as the monkey box. Why is it called the monkey box? Because organ grinders in Victorian England, Edwardian England, very popular. They would go around with their barrel organ playing tunes, but to get children out to ensure that they would pay a few pennies, they would have a monkey kept in a box. So when this thing appeared, everyone called it the monkey box. Now, if I tell you that a regimental medical officer was responsible for a battalion, that's 1,100 men at maximum strength, do you think that's enough doctors to men? My local general practitioner, GP, I asked her the other day how many people did she have on her books and she said personally had 9,000 people in Faversham in Kent where I live. Which means when you start thinking about it, if you join the army, you're actually at any time, whether you're in camp or marching or later in the trenches, always within a few hundred yards of a doctor. How many people here are now within a few hundred yards of a doctor? How long would it take to get to A&E? So although we are now very aware of the golden hour, so are they. Which means that every morning in camp, marching, wherever you are, you have a sick parade. Because your RMO, your regimental medical officer, is your GP. He is going to look after you. So when you turn up for sick parade, you turn up toothache, not a problem, army dental corps sort it out. You turn up, got a headache, well in the monkey box we have aspirin. You turn up, you've got a cough. You turn up, I don't know why it's you, you haven't actually been to the washroom for a week, uh. <laughs> then we're going to give you a laxative. And the number nine pill is commonly the most mentioned uh, pill given to soldiers. Basically, base carry on with your duties, but never go more than a few hundred yards from the latrine. Preferably stay closer. The number uh, nine pill was known for an explosive effect. <laughs> so, the thing to bear in mind here, this is only the doctor with your unit. And that's going to be the same with a, a, a brigade of artillery. Think of Dr. McRae. Or it's going to be cavalry, or infantry, or engineers. They all have the same essential ratio. And although we kind of think, well, that here, in case you get wounded, <coughs> the real reason they are there for most days is simply all the ailments that we all get. But bear in mind, at the time of the Great War, if you're a farm labourer and you fall off a haystack, 
You need to pay for that treatment. There is no free treatment. There is no free dental care. There's no free spectacles. I, I, I could continue, but obviously there is a risk of joining the army that you might get killed, but if you don't, everything is lovely and free. Now this is then what we have established. This then is the chain of evacuation. <clears throat> now, this is slightly later than the Great War, but believe me, it will do. There are four battalions in a brigade. This is then a three battalion. Each one has a regimental aid post. Then, if you're wounded badly, you'll be taken back to an ADS. Normally, about a thousand yards back, somewhere in a cellar. Anybody who's been to Ocean Villas, very likely that the ADS was established either in Avril Cellar, or we certainly know in the Red Barn, about 200 yards further away. However, you've then got this one, WWCP. What the hell's a WWCP? Well, the answer is, it's a walking wounded collecting post. You get hit in the arm in no man's land. In your uniform, you have a dressing. It's a double dressing, originally called the tortoise. It's always in the same place. Why is it always in the same place on every man? So everybody knows where to find Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You don't want to lay on the battlefield of the Somme with a hole in your chest going, oh, where's my bandage? Had it this morning. <laughs> you need to know where it is so you can pop it out and put it on the wound. Now, it was designed to be two because mainly people were thinking in terms of bullet injuries. And despite war films in which someone gets shot and they slap a bandage on it, that's brilliant. There's actually a hole at the back with blood coming out. And one of the functions of the bandage is to stop blood coming out and mud getting in. We'll come back to that in a minute. The key thing now is this. If your wound is very minor, then we do not need to tie up stretcher bearers or ambulances. You can go to the walking wounded collecting post and they will decide whether you need to go to the casualty clearing station 20 or 30 kilometers away or whether you in fact can go back to your battalion. So if you look here, we've got these dotted lines going the other way as people go back. Because you come in, you're a bit shocked, and this might surprise you to learn, in that monkey box, we're going to have a couple of things. Anti-tetanus serum, stopping you from getting lockjaw. One of the big killers of soldiers in the past was lockjaw. It's a horrible way to die. They're going to have means of pain relief, normally morphine under the tongue. We're also then going to be able to deal with anything like a fractured limb by having splints. We're going to be able to control bleeding by using a tourniquet. And by the way, under those circumstances, we'll probably mark you almost certainly with a wax crayon on the forehead. T for tourniquet, because that needs to be released every 20 minutes. Otherwise, you're going to lose the limb. And we're very careful to control all of this. And one of the things that really might surprise you is at this point here, at the RAP, almost certainly the orderly is going to give you a hot drink to replace fluids. It's going to be hot sugary tea or coffee. They're also going to give you a biscuit and a cigarette. You don't get that today, do you? <laughs> and the reason is very simple. It's actually a little bit of psychology. You've been hit, you're shocked, you've lost blood. Then they sit you down, give you some pain relief, sort out your broken arm, and then go, all right, son, cup of tea, no problem. Cigarette, biscuit, <coughs> can't be that bad. And of course, what we're also going to do with our patients is wrap them up. And by 1916-17, we have what's called a basically a primary package, which is the stretcher. In the stretcher, we actually have two blankets and a ground sheet. And every man that's wounded is going to be wrapped up to be kept warm, covered by the ground sheet, so they don't get wet. But then what's going to happen is this. If we actually have a really sick casualty, they're going to go to a field dressing station or to an advanced surgical centre, known at the time as the ADS. Because what we're trying to do is decide whether the person is fit to go back by rail, barge, any other method, light railway, back to the CCS 20 or 30 kilometers away. Let's go back to you three. In the Great War, if you came in with an abdominal injury, you come in with a head injury, you come in with a broken arm, who do we treat first? A broken arm. A 
broken up because you will get better. Head injury, if you're still alive, well, it's worth working on you. We have no penicillin. There is no antibiotics till 1941. Your survival rate in 1914 is 14%. You want that again? Anybody with a penetrating wound to the abdomen has 14% chance of survival. So what we're going to do in triage, potentially, and that might happen actually at the ADS or a little further back, is a moribund ward. Where we're going to put you, we're going to give you pain relief, we're actually going to make sure that you're comfortable, we're going to give you a cigarette, and we're going to leave you. Because you're not going to make it. And I, in 1988, interviewed somebody who actually was a... Um, in um, a pensioner at the Royal Hospital, he told me that in 1918, wounded severely by shell fire, he was remembers the doctor when he came off the ambulance, looking at him, pulling back the the, 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 the blankets, and simply saying to the stretcher bearers, "One, well, he didn't say anything. He just went over there, and that meant moribund." That night, he woke up in the dark, lying on a stretcher. He had to take the blanket from off his head because he couldn't see, but he knew there were people in the tent who had a torch and were picking up the dead and moving them, and he said, excuse me, can I have a cup of tea? <laughs> the stretcher bearer said, bloody hell, he's alive. Picked him up, took him through to a hospital tent where the doctor said, I thought I'd finished. And they went, no, sir, this one actually is still alive, and they operated on him, and I was able to interview him in 1988. So he was one of the few that survived the moribund ward. By the way, the doctors hated this decision because they're all our signatories to the Hippocratic Oath, which means you should make all of your patients well if you possibly can. You cannot play God, but the army wanted people to play God by making those decisions, which they were very, very uncomfortable about, but you can see exactly why they did it. By the way... If then you are severely injured, you go back to a base hospital or possibly back to the UK, back to what was known at the time as Blighty. Blighty is a Hindustani word, Urdu word, which means home area. So again, you're lying on a stretcher, you've been heavily knocked about by German shell fire. Doctor leans over you, says, well, son, stroke a luck, you've got a Blighty one, you'd probably smile. You're going to go home. My grandfather went home once, having been severely injured in September 1917. Made a full recovery, then what happens? Yeah. He goes back, and he does that four times. Well, he does it three times, because the fourth time the war ends. The key thing is that what we've got then is how we get you off the battlefield. And we will use every possible technique. We will use barges to move people who are too sick to be bounced around in a motor ambulance. We will actually have operating theatres in barges. We'll use hospital trains, everything we can to get you away. But of course, we've then got this as a thought. What about living conditions in the trenches? Pretty grim. What about trench foot? Trench foot is a feature really of 1914 to 15. Then it becomes less of an issue. How's that? The development of the trench board to keep your feet out of the mud. The issue of dry socks in wet, cold weather. Two soldiers at the front. And also issue of whale oil. On the basis that whales don't leak, if you rub your feet with whale oil, you can stop the water getting in. Using your socks dipped in linseed oil to actually make sure that they're waterproof. Very importantly, actually having a buddy team. We would never use the term buddy team, but let's call it a buddy team. Um, Glenn uh, and you, you are now 1916 in the trenches. It's been very wet and very cold for a number of days. You're now on day four. During that period, by the way, you have not been able to wash properly, and you certainly haven't been able to change your underwear. So Glenn would know if you were there in the dark, and you would know if Glenn was there in the dark, <laughs> even though you can't see him. However, we're now in a situation where we've made trench foot a disciplinary offence. So, in theory, you get trench foot, you will be disciplined, and by the way, you will go to prison when the war ends. There's no point putting you in prison during the war. No, no, no. That's not what happens. If you get trench foot, Glenn's the one that goes to prison. 
because he needs to make sure that you will take off your putties, will take off your boots, will take off your socks, and if needs be, you're going to have to warm up Glenn's feet. How the hell are you going to do that one? Well, you all remember getting cold, putting your hands under your armpits. His feet go under your armpit. Bear in mind, by the way, he hasn't washed his feet for five days. <laughs> so we've got that as an issue, but frankly, by 1917, Units rarely have a problem with immersion foot. By the way, the British Army will rediscover trench foot in the Falklands because we've forgotten the lessons of previous conflicts. Oh, and by the way, to save money, the British Army invests in directly molded sole boots that leak. But there's another matter. You know, the idea of saving money and harming soldiers seems hardly possible, does it? And look, then this is this. This is a trench. This is our standard trench in daytime, one man in ten on guard duty. Obviously, this guy here is writing war poetry. Um, <laughs> and at the end of the trench, we have a latrine. Latrine normally would have a tin in it. And in every unit, every company, is one man who wears a yellow armband. He's not an instructor. He is working directly to the RMO, he is the sanitary orderly. And his job, basically, is emptying, yes, you guessed what, into shell holes, covering it with chloride of lime, making sure it's put back. It's not a glamorous job, but vitally important to keep you lot healthy. By the way, he's excused working in the kitchens. <laughs> um, and for those people who've never seen this picture, that guy there is a very famous image of a Lancashire Fusilier outside a dugout near Plug Street. But the key thing is, this is often presented as an example, wait for it, of the onset of trench foot. Anybody here ever go fishing, river fishing? River fishing? Ever worn waders? He's wearing waders. Why is he wearing waders? REMC, wet coal trenches, we will issue waders to ensure you don't get trench foot. Interesting, isn't it? And yet this is often presented as a, an onset of trench foot. Uh, by the way, just out of interest, there is the wound stripe I've described on that guy's sleeve. He's been wounded at least once and gone back at least as far as a casualty clearing station. Now, in 1914, this was a responsibility of the REMC. It would later be taken over by the Army Service Corps. These guys here are Australian soldiers, all of them actually waiting to go into that building there in a ruined French village. They're going to go into a field laundry and bath unit. And coming out of the trenches, that's where you go. By the way, you can't also go on leave until you get a certificate uh, from your RMO indicating that you're free from vermin, okay? That's very important. Which means that, that let me think, um, Madam over there, you're an infantry officer. You know that your chance of being killed in action as a junior officer is about one in three. The private soldier next to you has a one in five chance of dying. You collectively have seen some very, very ugly sights. Um, you, sir, are a young lieutenant of the Army Service Corps, now responsible for running a field laundry and bath unit very important job and you've seen some ugly sights because every day in your possibly old brewery certainly that's the one that was used in poppering was actually an old brewery every day grubby soldiers come through that door there they strip off their clothing uh, they get into a vat of hot or lukewarm water your men will give them a towel and will give them a piece of soap they then lather themselves up come out the other side, put on a clean uniform, and then they go out probably to go get drunk with their mates or tell dirty stories or see a Charlie Chaplin film. But if you've seen some ugly sights with all those hairy soldiers coming in over there, you've seen some equally ugly sights, but they're not the same as yours. But without you, we're going to have lots and lots of sick soldiers. And one of the problems early in the war, once again, is the onset of body lice. And lice will give you trench fever. It's only later in the war we make the connection with lice. The body lice basically sucks blood. They also make you itchy. And when you scratch where they've bitten you, you actually basically inoculate yourself with lice.
feces. And it make you feel very rough. They give you a headache. They give you chills or a high temperature. They make you feel lousy. Mm -hmm. Indian soldiers call the lice chats. And as they squashed them or they burnt them with a candle, they would talk to each other, giving us the expression chatting. Next time you find people chatting, if they're not looking for lice, they're not doing it properly. <laughs> and of course, living in conditions like this, at least in theory, we should get a big problem with contagious diseases. We could get problems with tuberculosis. We generally don't. Why? Because we've got access to all the best medical facilities available. So let's remind ourselves about this. On the outbreak of war, you volunteer. When you volunteer, you are checked over medically and theoretically that will weed out people who are not suitable. Others actually are weeded out later on. But one thing about the British Army is that there is a big problem as a result of effectively very poor income and the Industrial Revolution. This photograph was taken at a tarp in France. These are, well, what the hell are they? Look at them. No, they're not. That is a group of men waiting for their 19th birthday so they can go into action. The youngest person in that picture is roughly 18 and a half. This is worth thinking about in terms of what happens. A number of officers, if you read their memoirs, say, I'm not in favor of Prussian militarism. But when I see the difference between the recruit coming in and what turns out at the end, you can only remember what the Duke of Wellington said. He said, recruits are the scum of the earth. Nobody then does the next sentence. And that is, but look what fine fellows we make of them. These guys here are gradually, gradually catching up. Oh, and by the way, it is worth saying, these guys here are 18 and a half going on 19, waiting for their 19th birthday, having been called up. This actually taken in 1918. Why was this photograph taken? The RAMC wanted to make a case to Parliament that this was wrong, that actually these people should not be committed to action because they are emaciated, they are underfed. Sadly for us, the NHS and everything that goes with it would come after the Second World War. There is a time lag. But let's remind ourselves about how all this works. One, you've got your dressing. Next, you know what to do if you're wounded. Every battalion has 16 stretcher bearers. You go into action over the top. This is a piece of fake film, but it will do for my purposes. Then look at this. This effectively is the layout of our ability to deal with the wounded. Little black crosses are regimental aid posts. White crosses are advanced dressing stations. From the further back, the CCSs, and then chain of evacuation running down the railway routes, road routes, to get you away from the front line. But all of this actually was insufficient on the 1st of July. The British Army had estimated 40,000 casualties on that day. The actual number of casualties was 57,000. And I met the son of the director of medical services in Albert. He ended up actually with not enough stretchers, not enough ambulances, not enough blankets, not enough dressings. All he was doing, his son told me, was going around with a bucket and a mug giving people a drink. Result of that was a nervous breakdown. We have a very, very bad day militarily on the 1st of July 1916. We also have a very bad day medically. It would never happen again. Battle of Arras 1917, Vimy Ridge. First casualties to arrive at Charing Cross Station in London a battle that begins early morning is noon the same day. Do you want that again? Noon the same day. We get back. Now, clearly, if you're going to get wounded in a major battle in the Great War, get wounded early in the day, you know? <laughs> Don't wait till the afternoon. <laughs> but nonetheless, we get a great deal better. And what else happens? 
Would you remember I mentioned primary suture? The problem with primary suture on the Western Front, and I'm picking an arm, is that actually it simply doesn't work. Because now we're fighting a war in farmers' fields. And unlike today, when we keep fields fertile by using nitrate fertilizer, in 1914, Belgium and French farmers were using manure. manure. You have an absolutely perfect breeding ground for bacteria. If you don't get everything out of that wound, you're going to have a problem. And if you do get an infection, it will probably be gangrene. By the way, gas gangrene is not caused by gas. Gas gangrene is it's so rapid, it forms a little bubbles of gas. And when the doctor squeezes the limb, you can actually hear them popping. That is gas gangrene. Only way to stop gangrene is cut it off. We don't have any penicillin. However, Dakin and Carroll, a French surgeon and a British surgeon, come up with an idea. And that is to leave the wound open, cover it, so obviously you don't leave it open to the air, but put into it a tube and we make a solution, used by the Canadians as well, called USOL, Edinburgh University Solution of Lyme. We're now going to flush away the bacteria. Every 20 minutes, every half an hour, nurse opens a tap, flushes away. It stinks, it's horrible, makes the bedding wet but the wound will granulate from the bottom up and eventually, wound in my right arm now, it heals. Got a horrible scar, but I can now make a fist. And if I can make a fist, what can I do? Do work. Correct, I can go back and serve. So that's one of the first thing that happens. Next thing, we start also to think in terms of other things that might happen to our patients. We start to think about blood loss. In 1914, as far as I know, there was one New Zealand doctor in the UK doing blood transfusion on a regular basis. The theory is known, it's not used militarily. So what we now get is a situation where, um, let's, let's pick on, on the, the, the Cruz family. Uh, Bob, you've been wounded, you've lost a load of blood, you're pale, you're sweaty, you're probably likely to go into heart failure, we need to give you some blood. Therefore, what we do in 1915 is we get you, you've come in actually with an ingrowing toenail into the casualty clearing station, and we say to you, if you give us a pint of blood, you can have an extra 10 days leave in Paris. So you go from having 10 days in Paris, uh, obviously watching in improving art and doing that kind of thing, um, uh, you can now get 20 days, that's, that's you get three weeks in Paris just for giving a pint of blood. Uh, by the way, if you give a pint of blood nowadays in the UK, you get a cup of tea and a biscuit. Um, this is a great deal better. But to make it work, what we do is we put the uh, basically the donor, that's you, high up on a stretcher, and basically the recipient low down. Uh, we're using gravity, uh, invented by Isaac Newton. Um, uh, uh, but, but if you, Bob, have got a, a head wound, you'll have a high blood pressure. If that happens, the blood goes the wrong way. So what we then need to do is say, we're not going to do that. What we'll do is actually right, use a system of drawing it into a bottle. So, late 1915, we now take the blood into a bottle, and when we've got it, we put it in the fridge. Don't mix it up with the yogurt, because it ruins your breakfast. <laughs> but the thing is, what then happens is when we take it out, we just put it up, and it's coagulated, it's clotted. What we now need to do is put a citrate in it. What's a citrate? Basically, that, that stuff that's quite interesting in lime and lemon will stop it from actually coagulating. So we then give Bob, our patient, a pint of blood. He actually becomes nice and pink. Lips go less blue than they were. Ooh, can I have another pint? Absolutely fine. Then you come in. We give you exactly the same pint of blood. This is 1916. You go purple and you die. <laughs> we don't know about blood types. Now we do, and by the Battle of Cambrai, November 1917, we have blood banks. I'll let you into a secret. Right now in Ukraine, actually probably right now in Israel, soldiers, men and women, are giving a pint of blood before they go into action. Why? Because we discovered post-Vietnam, if you actually give blood before you go into action and you're wounded, your immune system and recovery system has actually been kick-started. You are more likely to make a full recovery if you've given blood. It's not just self-interest. So we've now got the ability to replace blood rather than just giving you a hot a drink of nice sweet tea, which is lovely, but actually won't really cut the mustard. Next thing, early in the war, 
facial injury. I don't know, shell explodes, slides across, hits me in the nose, takes my nose off. I've got a problem. A, I look a bit like a pig. B, obviously, <laughs> I've got a problem if I've got a cold. So what we now do in 1914-15, we give you a tin nose. It's painted to match your face, held on with a pair of fake spectacles. Not a problem, so you try and kiss your girlfriend and your nose falls off. <laughs> so what we start to do at St. Mary's Hospital at Sidcup is basically plastic surgery, reconstructive surgery, using either skin grafts or what they did was building what's called a pedicule. A pedicule basically is a column of flesh attached to the face to establish a blood supply from the face rather than from the hand or somewhere else. Then we remove that. We've now got viable flesh on one side of my missing nose. We do it all again. We put in a false bit of cartilage. Then our new nose. Now, none of that was happening in 1914. We then get a situation where we get other things. We're now, we're thinking about this. In 1914, if you had a fractured femur, uh, let's go here. One, two, three, four, five, okay? Fractured femur. The femur, longest bone in the body, strongest muscles in the body. If that bone is broken, the ends of the bones push together like that, or are pulled together like that massive shock massive blood loss so actually 1914 you get a fractured femur david you've had it blend you've had it you've had it you've had it i don't know how you survived but you did okay we have an 80 percent mortality rate then we discovered that dr thomas from wales has worked in the mining industry developed the thomas splint it goes round the thigh Make sure you don't trap important bits. It also then goes down below the leg and has a V-shaped piece of metal. It's two bars, V-shaped piece of metal. What we do, lay our patient down, fairly obviously. We then don't give him any anesthetic. Sounds cruel, doesn't it? We then put a loop of bandage around his boot and round the V-shaped insert. And then what the doctor does is he simply takes a piece of stick. You can use a pencil, actually. And we start turning it round and our piece of bandage gets shorter and it pulls the ends of the bones apart and eventually the patient goes <sighs> then you give him anesthesia then you sort his leg out because what you've done is you've pulled it back to a natural position it stopped that shock, stopped that blood loss now, 1917 Thomas Splint used on you, you survive 1917, Thomas Splint used on you, you survive. 1918, Thomas Splint, used, even actually at regimental aid post level, really right forward. Glenn, you survive. David, sorry, things go wrong sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> this could be a short broadcast. Absolutely. But we, we actually go to an 80% survival rate. <coughs> and really, by 1917, if you can get back to a casualty clearing station, 20 or 30 kilometers in the battlefield, your death rate there, even listen hook, which some of you might know, is 3%. And what's going to kill you probably is septicemia peritonitis, because that's the thing we can't deal with. Oh, by the way, by 1917, abdominal injuries, that was you earlier on, wasn't it? You bounce up to a grand total of 40% survival. It's still less than 50%. And then we've got this. We've got the most famous doctor of the war no it's not okay this is basically our very very famous doctor who actually was son of the bishop of liverpool an olympic athlete noel chavas in 1916 noel chavas was involved in an attack near guillemont after the battle they were the wounded were very slow at coming in it became dark what he did was he went out with a padre with a torch shouting for the wounded now he was awarded the victoria cross for this but there are two schools of thought one what a hero two what happens if he got shot you have a battalion with no medical officer the following year during passchendaele wounded in the abdomen while actually working on a patient he carried on with the operation, having stuffed the wound, and then was taken to the rear, where he died on the road between Ypres and Poppering, and that's where he's buried today. 
However, the really odd thing about Noel is he receives his second VC posthumously, given to his mother and father at Buckingham Palace. But he dies in a hospital, or casualty clearing station, operated by Colonel Martin Leake, an expert on abdominal injuries. Also, the holder of two VCs. One from the Boer War, one from the First World War. This man was the only one to get one, actually get two, in the Great War. So let's then just go a quick reminder. Where are we? This then is a very good example of the junction between the front line evacuation and evacuation to the rear. How do I know that? That man there is wearing an SB armband. It does not mean silly bugger. It means stretcher bearer. They are part of the unit of the regimental aid post, the RMO. There are 16 of them. You normally <coughs> double them up in action. Then you've got, obviously, a bigger number of stretchers available. Otherwise, you've only got eight, which when you think about a battalion of, say, 900, is not great. You double them up. So what's happened here is our patient's been brought back and has actually been handed over to an orderly and somewhere off here we actually have our regimental medical officer who's making sure who's fit for, to travel. This guy here, clearly whatever's wrong with him, does not have an abdominal injury because he's having a cup of hot sweet tea. Mm. That man over there has got a foot injury. I know for a fact, I don't think it was that serious because when I had him lit red, he comes down this trench and says, Jesus, 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 he bangs his foot and says another word that starts with F and has only have four letters. Um, <laughs> but there he is, and they're waiting now to be evacuated. Uh, it is worth saying, by the way, if you don't know, wounded men always go feet first. Why? Because the stretcher bearer at the rear has got a view straight down at his face. So if he vomits, if he actually has a seizure, you can deal with him. If he's the other way around, you might not notice. By the way, corpses go the other way around. What we're then going to do is get you to the rear. Where are you going to go to? You're going to go to the advanced dressing station. But then start thinking uh -huh. about some of the problems with this one. This is an ideal condition. Here we've got a man going to the walking wounded collecting post, a man being carried feet first because he's wounded, he's not dead, been taken away. I would like a hot meal for everybody that's pointed oh, out God. that this guy here on the ridge at Pilkham Ridge actually is being taken away. Very often students will say, is he dead? If he was dead, they're not going to move him. Mm -hmm. That guy is there. And you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven men for one patient. You imagine if you're going to do triage, you have to be certain that guy is worth moving. Because if he's not, stays where he is. This is the um, men in row. Many of you will know it. How about this as an example of abject medical failure? Well, no. You see, the wounded, including, by the way, a Geneva cross-wearing REMC man, walk into the rear. They're walking to the walking wounded collecting post. These guys here, that man there, have been wounded, but they're all wrapped up and they've received their bandages. They have attached to them a label saying the nature of their injury, all assessed, ready to go. And that bloke there, having a bit of a rest, is sat on an enormous pile of stretchers and blankets because we need them to go the other way. Yes, the ambulance, this truck has fallen off the road, but this is the way it's going to work. Now, nowadays that wouldn't happen. Nowadays we'd pop them in a helicopter and off they'd go. Well, oddly, we don't have helicopters in 1916 <laughs> or 17. And then back to your ADS underground. And if you look at it, what we've got is the process of bandaging. That guy's looking a bit grim. That guy may or may not be shell-shocked. But here, this man is filling in the tallies of each of the patients, saying what treatment they've received, what actually, there's a bit of string there, what actually was the nature of their wounds, and what we'll then do at each stage of evacuation all we have to do is take out the little insert what's happened we know what we've got there's no point asking him what's the nature of your wound 
I don't know, it hurts. I mean, you know, it's not much good. We need to know. And we're going to use every means we can to get you away. Light railway. Here, the Calais wagon pulled by a, a mule. Here, back to, effectively, a main dressing station. And you'll notice that it's marked by the Geneva Cross. It would also have a Union flag to show where, what it is and where it is so you can find it. Here, men being put onto horse ambulances with motor ambulances, assumingly motor ambulances for the most serious, horse ambulances for the less seriously wounded. You'll see here, we've got rum jars, because frankly, that might cheer you up a bit. <laughs> and we've also got trestles. And the trestles are so that our doctor does not have to kneel down and get covered in mud. He's going to work at roughly waist height. It also allows my doctor, when the patient comes in, having checked him over at the front, to take his hand and run it under the stretcher. And if it comes up covered in blood, we're going to have to roll our patient over because he may not be aware that he has other injuries. Very, very important. And then, of course, we've got this. This is the exterior of a main dressing station. And you're going to say, well, you know, why haven't they all been taken away yet? The answer is they will be over time. And this is when we get some of the bottlenecks. And there was an argument mid-war that we don't need ADSs, we don't need MDSs. What we need to do is get them away as quickly as possible. The Americans try that in 1918. And reading the memoirs of an American surgeon, he said that the convoys that were created to getting the men off the battlefield, particularly with transport going the other way, meant that they were evacuated quickly, but took two to three hours to arrive where they could be treated. And repeatedly, he said, we opened the back door of the ambulance and everybody was dead because they'd simply bled out or died of shock. So the debate continues. And here you can see the whole process. You can see my trestles, the ambulances, basically triage is going on here. They're making decisions. Our patients are being taken away, so they're actually going to be treated somewhere else, ready to go that one. Moving wounded from a dressing station, 12th of April, 1918. Now, I haven't mentioned women so far. Should really mention them. Women are on the battlefield as members of the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry. The unfortunately named Fannies, but there we are. Their job is actually ambulance drivers, but unlike ambulance drivers of the Army Service Corps, they actually are medically trained, and they are all volunteers. The next time you're going to meet women would be at casualty clearing station level, because that's where you meet your nurses, where you're going to meet sister, where you're going to meet the VADs. Voluntary aid detachment, by the way, drawn from the Red Cross and St. John's Ambulance. And here, a base hospital with the wounded arriving. And you can look at it and you go, okay, this batch here, walking wounded, they're their very prominent labels being taken away to get somewhere rather clearer. And here, a rather bigger example of a CCS with patients being assessed, ready to be taken away to either dressing or to go into a ward, or indeed, as we know, potentially actually off to a moribund ward. But that gives you some idea of just the pure numbers of people. But to remind ourselves, what can we now do? Well, this one shows massive blood loss on the floor, but by 1917, we can replace it. We can actually do blood transfusion. We can now sort out that fractured femur. We can, to some extent, stop the end onset of gangrene. And it is getting better. And this is clearly what we call a Nissen hut, concert hut, being used as a base hospital. When it comes to gas, gas is definitely a problem, both in terms of these guys here, and also, by the way, when it comes to the nursing staff, because wounded men who have been gassed, very often mm. the gas has been absorbed by their clothing, but the actual death rate from gas is actually only 3%. Bear in mind, Dr. Clooney, a member of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, is the man that develops the first effective gas mask. And once you've got a gas mask, very few people are going to die from gas. This is a demonstration, by the way, for the purposes of the camera. This is a lorry that turns into an operating theatre and everything that was in it. It, it really is a very, very good system.
In the same way as this is a hospital barge which allows a wounded that cannot be jolted to be taken away from the battlefield. They use the canal system to get our patients away. And now we're right down on the coast. We're right down on the coast near Atar. We're either at Abbeville or we're possibly at Rumor. My granddad was evacuated in the spring of 1917 to 13 Canadian Stationary Hospital at Etarp, where he made a full recovery. Thank you, Canada. <laughs> in September, he was evacuated to three Stationary Hospital at um, uh, Rouen, where he went to the American Lakeside Hospital. And a couple of years ago now, guiding a cycle tour of the Somme, I met a man called Bill Blarney III. Bill Blarney said to me, can you tell me what my granddad did in the war? He was a surgeon, by the way, so was his granddad. I said, I have no idea. I don't know anything about the American Army. He said, he joined the REMC. Oh, I said, you know, where was he? American Lakeside Hospital, Rouen. Oh, number three stationary. Do you know where all hospitals were? I went, no, I know that one because that's where my granddad was on the 18th of September, 1917. He got his phone out, phoned home and said, can you tell me, and he's just talking to his wife, what my granddad was doing on the 18th of September, 1917. He was supervising surgeon. He would have seen my granddad. So I did the only thing you could do under those circumstances. I bought him a beer. <laughs> <laughs> and then back to the UK. And here in the UK, we have very typically the hospital blues. Think about them as being like big pyjamas, yeah? They're designed to be rolled up if you have to because they're all oversized. You wear it with a white shirt, blue, uh, a red tie. They are blue. You wear your normal regimental headgear with it. And when you go out to the local pub, you probably never buy a pint again until you make a recovery and then you return. And of our wounded in the Great War, 80% make a full recovery and return. Of those people who are suffering from shell shock, using the new talking therapy, 80% make a recovery. I'm not going to say a full recovery, they make a recovery and they return. One problem, by the way, with officers is unlike the men, the officers were taken to Edinburgh to hospital at Craig Lockhart away from the battlefield. The men were kept in the theatre of operation and told, don't worry, you haven't failed, you're just broken at the moment, but when you get better, you will go back to your men. And I have a theory that somebody like Wilfred Owen, having been taken away from the battlefield, being kept back in the UK for a number of months, when he went back, had to demonstrate how he'd made a full recovery, and that's why he actually got himself killed. The key thing for us is that casualties in the Great War are high. 850,000 British, Australian, Canadian, New Zealand dead. However, had it not been for the REMC, it would have been far higher. And without the advances, advances of the Great War, we would not have the situation where my granddad could survive the way he did. And I'm sure somewhere in your family is somebody who was wounded and survived because of the REMC. And this last image, when I first showed it in 1984, was quite shocking. Now it isn't, I'm afraid to say, <clears throat> Iraq and Afghanistan has basically made us almost inured to this. But these two guys here are at the National Limb Fitting Center at, Roham at Roehampton. One with one leg, one with both legs gone, smiling. Why? That photograph was taken just about 11.20 on the 11th of November, 1918. The war's over, they're going to go home. And to give you an idea what that means, let's just pick you again. You are 1914, outbreak of war. David, for the sake of this argument, you are now the 11th of November, 1918. You are the entire CEF, uh, CEF BEF, I don't care, the whole lot. What percentage of you are going to die? One in three. One in three, 30%. percent 11.8%. German army, 13%. French army, 16%. Serbian army, 50%, because their medical situation collapses completely. In other words, 88.2% of our guys go home. 
That's misleading because if we have an army, but about 60% of Canadians are actually in the infantry. 40% are everything else. They're Army Service Corps, they are Medical Corps, they're engineers, everything else. And actually, in terms of then the infantry, you've got about roughly one in five chance of dying. But overall, it's 11.8%. Uh, by the way, why is the French casualty so high? The answer is they don't have regimental medical officers. They keep their doctors well off the battlefield. That's great for them. We lose 700 doctors killed in the Great War. 700. That's a lot of people who obviously were brilliant minds to lose. But to put that in perspective, let's now make you a pilot of the Royal Flying Corps in 1914. You can fly about 150 kilometers in your airplane. You've got a joystick, a rudder barb, great. Do you have a machine gun? No, it's too heavy. Do you have a radio? No, you can't use it. It doesn't actually work, it's too heavy. Do you have a parachute? Of course not, you know, which is not possible. What the hell do you do then? Well, you write messages, you put them in a weighted bag, and you chuck them out. It's really efficient, yeah? So you can probably fly the English Channel, land on the other side, refuel, and do a bit more, okay? You two are now two Canadians, yeah? All cock and brown, okay? You're going to fly from Nova Scotia in the early 1919 with the intention of flying a Vickers Vimy. Now, the Vickers Vimy was intended to bomb Berlin. We never do it, but we could have done. So the idea was it could fly all the way to Berlin, bomb Berlin, and fly back and land in the UK. That's not bad, is it? We've gone from 150 kilometers to be able to fly over a thousand miles. And we're gonna send you now to Newfoundland to fly due east. Now, we've replaced the bombs, don't worry. We've replaced those with lots of fuel. Where the hell are you gonna he head in 1919? England. You don't get there. You actually land in the Republic of Ireland and you mistake a field, uh, a marsh for a field, and you smash the aircraft up. But you make it. We can now fly the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So in basically four years, five if you want to push it, we've gone from 150 kilometers to basically 1,500 miles. And we've got there. And by the way, you have parachutes and a radio and other bits that you might need, yeah? Now, if that's a revolution in technology, what's happened to medicine and surgery? It's a revolution. Mm -hmm. And the argument is to this day that without the Great War, it would have taken roughly 20 years to catch up. <laughs> Only got to think about it that penicillin is a product of the Second World War. That's the one thing we're missing. That The golden bullet of antibiotics is the one thing that doesn't exist. Plastic surgery, blood transfusion, battlefield x-ray, you, know, you know, primary suture being thrown away and replaced by wound irrigation. It's all there. So what I want to do is to say for you, the Great War is massively effective at improving our ability to make soldiers better. And the reason that I'm here now is not luck. It is with my grandma. It's not luck with my granddad. That luck was actually that the REMC, the doctors, the nurses, the VADs, were so bloody good at making our relatives better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Don't ask me where babies come from. <laughs> How do they recruit? For the stretcher bearers, the hospitals, the you know, the, the staff and stuff. Mm. Everybody was looking, okay. right. looking for. I see. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. there was two different groups. The regimental stretcher bearers are very often the band, yeah, but not invariably. They're often the band, um, and, and that's what they do. Uh, they're trained by the RMO, uh, and they very often. If they get any good, he will give them a tourniquet, he will give them a Spencer Wells forceps to get hold of an artery. That's the kind of thing they do. The guys at the REMC very often have either some medical training. I, I met one, basically, a sergeant of the REMC. I asked him how he joined the REMC. He said, I didn't. I turned up in the recruiting office and they said, what do you do? I said, I'm a theology student. He arrived then at Millbank at the headquarters of the REMC. So, excuse me, why am I here? And somebody in the orderly office said, 
you have an ology, you're going to join the REMC. It was theology, nothing else, but that's what it was. I mean, God help it could have been phrenology for all he knew, but that's how we got the job. But the other group of people who are going to be REMC are going to be potential conscientious objectors, all prepared to serve, but not go into combat. And the, the, the one man that gets the most medals in the Great War is, in fact, an REMC stretcher bearer. Um, so, because of what he does. But he was a Quaker. He, he did not want to fight. He chose to do it. I mean, you know, people also volunteered for the REMC because they, they knew it was relatively, relatively safe. Mm -hmm. Yes? Right, going back to your flow chart of... of yeah. Where did the motorized ambulance operate? Right, okay. Motorized ambulance. Let's let's go let's go forward again. Okay. Shall I cut to a second? So here we go, here we go. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, basically it would normally run backwards from really behind the ADS, right through there. So you're using field ambulance, does that make sense? That one there could be field ambulance transport, but stretcher bearers, that's 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 handheld. Or railways, yeah? From there onwards, it is motor ambulance or light railway or standard railway or barge, whatever it actually is. Okay, so it's it's basically back behind the lines as long as the enemy can't see it. You know, or as happens at Essex Farm when McRae operated, they had to wait until dark so the ambulances could drive up. So the wounded were kept there all day. So they just simply couldn't get them away because they were under direct observation. Okay, that's how close they actually are, which is why you've got the concrete bunkers now at um, Essex Farm, because they had to operate somewhere safe. Up until, um, or pretty much up until the, the fall of 1918, it was, it was because the war was fairly static and stable. Yeah. But once you get into the 100 days, then they're, you're, basically you're, you're uh, taking 10 or 20 a mile of territory yeah. a day. So how does that impact okay. the positioning of right. the... I should have said, right, the, the, the field ambulance, every brigade yeah, of four battalions, later three if you're British, not if you're a Canadian, has a field ambulance, which means with a division you have three field ambulances, and what you would have in either the advance or retreat is that you have one that's working, yeah. one that's moving, and one that's either packing or unpacking. Right. So basically, you're leapfrogging all the time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and, and they were very good at it. It did help a great deal in the Great War, actually, that it was pretty static. It helps in yeah. terms of logistics. I mean, the Army Service Corps must have made life much, much easier for them because it was static. And certainly for ambulance units, they are static, you know, for much of the war. Once it starts moving, it does become complicated, but not impossible. Uh, because the flexibility was built in. When they originally planned field ambulances and the chain of evacuation, they were aware they might have to be leapfrogging to get away or that get forward. The casual, the, the survivability rates because there's... Like, you would it, start to lose more people yeah. because there is no choice. So and you have to make some very tough decisions then. Yeah. About that, in yeah. The last hundred days, that's where the Canadian force. Well, casualties the casualties in the hundred days are higher than any other point in the war, and I think you've hit the nail on the head there. That's because I suspect the, the, the level of care just isn't as good. It just it can't be. You know, on the first day at Amiens, <clears throat> that's seventh of August, the Canadian Corps had a big problem with this system because they advanced so quickly over so much ground yeah. that couldn't keep up with them. So they're advanced dressing stations became heavily clogged with guys. There's mm -hmm. tremendous photos that show them just packed with yeah. wounded guys waiting to be evacuated. I, I'd love some of those photos, so another time I can illustrate it. That'd be lovely. If you can, if you can direct me to that, that'd be great. Thank you. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah, hey. uh, yes, over there and then you. Okay, yes, Was like the British system, then the Canadians, Australian, they're... The same. It's all essentially the same. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because apart from anything else, that they were they were intertwined. They couldn't use different systems. It simply wasn't going to work. They had to be some commonality to make that work. Absolutely. So, something about the uh, the spring offensive in 1917. Yeah, 18. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, no. 18, of course. Um, are, are you, I know you, you say you don't know a ton about the German side of this. Uh, was, was did this have a big role to play? I seem to remember reading something about it. And the limitations of the Germans with uh, in their own yeah. created sailing. Yeah. Fine. I mean, the, the Germans have a big problem from the very beginning of the war that raw materials are very, very short. 
one of the raw materials they're short of is rubber. And you immediately think car lorry tires, yeah? Well, think again. Think respirators, yeah? Think tubes for blood transfusion or for wound irrigation. Once you're short of rubber, you've got a big problem. The German respirator in the Great War, the, the one from 1917 onwards, uh, basically called the leather mask, is made of leather, not anything else, because they can't do rubberized fabric. Early in the war, they do 15, 16 rubberized fabric. The, the leather that they use, do we have any dog lovers here? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Cannot be pig, cannot be cowhide. They sweat. Dogs don't. It's dog leather. Okay? But because there's no rubber, you can't have the hose to so the filter of the small box respirator, which is the feature of British and Canadian soldiers from September 1916 onwards. So our filter's here, it's all the weight's taken, it's a big, big filter. The German gas mask is on the face with a filter on the front, and if you look at it, the string that goes to the back of your head that takes the weight of the filter. The filter cannot be very big, so endurance for the, the German gas mask is far less than your one or my one. Okay, and the next thing would then be in terms of then evacuation of the wounded. Just think about motor ambulances with solid tyres with the wounded in it. That's what the Germans are dealing with. Think about the fact they have problems with horses getting enough forage. The horses can't pull very much weight. You know, the German doctors are really, really good. And I, I met one guy who lost a leg in Germany. Basically, um, everyone said he was going to die. His German doctor in the prisoner of war camp said, you are not going to die. I will sort this out. And even though he was a Brit, sorted out, he lost his leg, but didn't lose his life. They, the Germans were very, very good. I mean, their death rate was 13%, even though they lose the war, compared to the French death rate of 16%. Okay? They were very good at looking after the wounded, including ours. And I did come across at least one um, REMC orderly, captured by the Germans during the Kaiserschlacht, um, he was told to actually work with the Germans, as you have to do under the Geneva Convention or Hague Convention. He worked for them for a week, and after about two days, he was so efficient, actually, although he was, get this right, a corporal, he was telling Germans how to do their job, and eventually they made him an honorary sergeant in the German army <laughs> so we could carry on giving orders because people kept questioning and eventually the officer said no he's an our sergeant you know listen to him he knows what he's doing yeah in 1919 he wrote to Berlin and asked for a pension from the German army <laughs> <laughs> miserable bastards turned him down <laughs> but there we are that, that's a true story absolutely okay good I'm now between you and lunch by the way <laughs> I'm aware the British Red Cross Society and the St. John's Ambulance were part of the BEF. How were they related to or integrated with right, okay. REMs? All of the work done in the UK was run by the two as part of the voluntary aid detachment. Two thirds women, one third men. Nobody ever knows about the men in the, the VADs. They only know about the women. And people make programs like the Crimson Field about the VAD women. Well, there are men too. They blush unseen. But everything done in the UK is done by civilians, by, by the Red Cross and St. John's Ambulance as part of the VAD organisation. So those stationary hospitals in the UK, the stately homes, which I haven't mentioned, converted into recovery uh, 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 hospitals, were all run by them. Uh, but during the war, the decision was taken to send VADs to France and Belgium and, and to elsewhere. They met a lot of opposition from the army nurses because they, they felt that they weren't very well enough trained. They were not well enough disciplined. It, over time, that, that breaks down when they realize actually they need them, but they cannot cope without them. And the casualty clearing stations and the base hospitals, stationary hospitals, are, are basically staffed by the, the Imperial Nursing Yeomanry, but also then by, um, oh, sorry, Queen Alexander's Nursing Service, but also by the VADs. Okay. So they're operating then in the UK, but also on the continent. That was a difference between the Canadian nursing and the British. Canadian nurses were trained. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were probably better trained. Our, our, our ones were 
Red Cross and St John's Ambulance trained, uh, and that was why there was some opposition to them, which has to be said.